We now turn our attention to price changes, which are more complicated than income changes, and we'll hold our attention for most of the rest of this chapter. Suppose one has an initial budget constraint, as I've drawn here. Let's call it BC0. And I want to consider the case of the price of x falling. There are four other possible cases to consider. The price of x rising, the price of y falling, and the price of y rising. I'm only going to consider one. The other cases get worked out in the homework problems and old exam problems. And so certainly you need to be able to analyze all those other cases, but they follow directly from this case. It's just that the geometry is going to look different. The first thing to remember when you have a fall in a price is that the affordable set needs to expand. A price has gotten lower. That's good news for the consumer. The consumer can afford to buy more stuff, so the affordable set goes up. Don't make the mistake of thinking that because the price of X has fallen, that the affordable set has to fall. That's wrong and will, will start you off on completely the wrong track. When a price falls, that's good news for the consumer, the affordable set expands. When a price rises, that's bad news for the consumer, the affordable set shrinks. So, this is going to lead to an expansion of the affordable set. Next thing to ask is, in what way, geometrically, will the affordable set expand? In what precise way will the affordable set expand? You'll recall that the slope of the budget constraint is minus px over py. And if you don't remember that, then you can re recall what the equation for the budget constraint is, which is income equals expenditure, i equals pxx plus pyy, and then do as we've done before, this is i. And do what we've done before, which is solve that equation for y, recognize it in the form y equals mx plus b, and the slope will be minus px over py. This has a px, the slope of budget, the budget constraint has a px in it. And what we're studying here is that the price of x has fallen. So the slope is going to be affected. Here's the way to figure out how. Remember what the intercepts were. If you don't remember it mathematically, there's a, a, way, to re, uh, a way to intuitively recall what it is. This point in the lower right represents what happens if you don't buy any y, just spend all your money on x. And if you spend all of your money on x, the amount of x you can buy is i over px. Similarly, if you don't it, I'm not sure I said that right. If you, if you don't buy any y, then the amount of x that you can buy is i divided by px. If you don't buy any x and only y, then the amount of y that you can buy is i divided by py. In this problem, we have the price of x falling, but we don't have any change in the price of y. We don't have any change in income. So the upper left point, which is i divided the price of y, has no, ch no, no change in either the numerator or denominator, so it stays where it was before. But the bottom right point, i divided by px, does have a change in, in one of its components. It doesn't, its numerator doesn't change, but its denominator changes. The price of x has fallen, so the denominator has gotten smaller, so the whole fraction has gotten bigger. So what we're going to get is that point moving. For example, then, the new budget constraint would look something like this. So this is i divided by, let's say, px prime. Prime is a way that mathematicians often denote the new value of something. So it's the new value of px. We've got an expansion of the affordable set, which is what we said we, we wanted intuitively. Uh, the affordable set has rotated around the upper left hand, around its upper left hand corner, so it's expanded in the x direction. Now that doesn't 
mean we can only buy more X. So we might buy, well, there are various things that can happen. But the budget constraint has expanded in a definite kind of way in the way I've just drawn. So in terms of consumer behavior, we had an initial tangency point like this, and a final tangency point, maybe, maybe like that. Actually, the final tangency point might be in many different places, and we'll study that in a lot of detail quite quite soon. So our initial point is A, our final point is B. You can see that uh, consumption of X used to be there and consumption of X is now here. Uh, then that's not necessarily where the old budget constraint hit the X axis. Consumption of Y has also changed. So the change in the price of X doesn't only affect the quantity demanded of X, it can also affect the quantity demanded of Y. In fact, it usually does affect the quantity demanded of Y. Let's put some arbitrary numbers here. Suppose that the the old price of X was $2 a unit. The new price of X, PX prime, is $3 a unit. I'm sorry, it's fallen, so it's, it's bringing down to uh, $1 a unit. And let's suppose that the that A's x-coordinate was, oh, I don't know, 10, and B's x-coordinate is perhaps 15. On the, the graph on the right, I'm going to sketch these numbers. I'm going to have px on the vertical axis and x on the horizontal axis. My original px is $2 a unit and my final px is $1 a unit. At the initial value of $2 a unit, I was buying uh, 10 units of X, so $2 a unit, that's the original high price, so th that corresponds to point A in my diagram. The new lower price of $1 a unit corresponds to point B in my diagram. So I want to indicate, I want to graph point A in my right-hand graph. So my right-hand graph is going to be $2 a unit, so I'll have the 2 on the vertical axis, and then the amount of X that I consume is the X coordinate of point A. The X coordinate of point A is 10. So that's the point I have. Then I want to graph the new situation with the lower price, and that's point B. The lower price is $1 a unit, and at point B the x-coordinate is 15. Okay, so I have a line like this. Similarly, and I'm going to make this diagram less precise, we could also graph Px versus Y. Again, the Px values are 2 and 1. 2 corresponds to point A. And uh, let me put some, let me make up some numbers for Y. Let's say this is 30 and this is 33. So at $2 a unit, A's y-coordinate is 30. At $2 a unit, you have a 30 consumption of y. Then when the price of x has fallen to 1, you're at point B. The consumption of y in my graph has gone up to 33. So at when the price of x falls to 1, the price of y goes to 33, you can also join these with a line. The 
diagram drawn on the upper right actually doesn't have a, a common name. But the diagram that I drew just before it, this diagram here, and in particular its straight line, does have an important name. I'm going to pause for five seconds and see if you can make a guess of what name we call that, that straight line. So, five seconds is up. We call this straight line a demand curve. This is where demand curves come from. So, as I said in the very beginning of class, demand curves aren't completely obvious. They're indeed a result of all the theoretical background that we've been constructing up to this point. Consumer preferences, indifference curves, budget constraints, price changes, tangencies, all this stuff are what combine to give demand curves. And if you don't agree with the assumptions that we've made along the way, then this explanation of demand curves wouldn't be, wouldn't hold. And uh, indeed, you might not think that demand curves exist, or you might not think that demand curves are important. But in neoclassical economics, this is the way we derive demand curves. So in the next lesson, we will talk about uh, price changes in a lot more detail.